Dr. Charles, I think your mic is off. Hi, Lee. Sister Lee, you're looking good. I usually look bad, right? Oh, no, we usually don't see. No, I usually do. <laughs> What's the deal with that background, Lawrence? It looks Byzantine. Oh yes, uh, that's a that's a a created background. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, the den. I didn't even think about my background today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have to go get something just now. Okay. <laughs> Oh, boy, how did that happen? I thought I'd unplug that. I had my stove on, and I do think I'd better leave that on. Oh, yeah. Good to see you guys. Well, same. You too. But, you know, I use a rice cooker to cook, and then I don't have to think about I put all the kind of stuff in there, and then I don't have to think about it. It turns off when it's ready, and then it keeps it warm until I'm ready to eat. So this was water. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, OK. Well, then. <laughs> say no more. <laughs> yeah. Well, since it's 1030 and, and we're going to be up against a clock today, we're actually going to end about five or 10 minutes early. Um, I think we should get started. And then as people come in, they can join us. Today's uh, topic is threats. Threats. And I should say, welcome everybody who's here. Glad you could make it. I hope that you will uh, get involved in our conversation and we can have some sharing of your ideas. Uh, the way this format works is I will more or less give you a prompt so that we have a discussion organized around something. But the real value in this is uh, what you share between each other. And that's really the whole idea of brainstorming. You know, it's not just the storm in my head, but the storm that uh, we can all create when we uh, put our all of our storms together, you know, and, and come up with ideas that none of us would have thought of by ourselves, maybe. But when we put all of those ideas together, often and a, a better idea comes out of it. It comes from the idea that all of us will always be smarter than any one of us, you know? So if we throw some ideas together, let the ideas fight, we don't have to. And uh, as that happens, then new ideas or new approaches, as we, especially as we think about what the other person says relative to what everyone is saying, then out of that, we can start to see some uh, possibilities of new ideas that any one of us would never have thought of. <clears throat> so that uh, said, uh, today's topic is th threats. And one of my mentors once said, all of human relations can somehow be boiled down to threat and non-threat. If people make us feel threatened, we don't like them. Or if something threatens us, we don't like that thing. And if it doesn't, we're at least tolerant of it. And we don't, you know, we don't bother about it, you know. Uh, and, and then there's the, the whole issue of 
real versus imagined threats. And one of my martial arts instructor used to point out often, missed by an inch, missed by a mile. And what he meant by that was, you don't have to uh, make big grand movements to dodge a punch. If it misses you by an inch or even a half an inch, it's as good as the punch didn't, didn't happen, you know? And the underlying message of that was, in life, we go through things and we think that that thing could hit us, but it's not a thing, you know? It's like when people call you names. We can say, oh, words hurt. They hurt if we translate them into something that hurts, but the word itself doesn't have any meaning. You know, words don't have inherent meanings. They ha have meanings that are understood between the, the, the uh, giver and the receiver of the message. So that said, you know, if we feel threatened by something, it's like, well, maybe we've given up our power to that thing and we allow it to threaten us. And somewhere in this conversation, we will, need, we will find it useful, I think, to talk about how we deal with the threats. What is, what is the power that we individually have to deal with the threat regardless, I should say, regardless of how the perpetrator of the threat uh, feels or what they intend, what is the power that we have to deal with that threat? Is it real? Is it, is it something that actually could hurt us? And if so, can we somehow uh, mitigate the damage? In, in other words, can we, can we make the damage less or even acceptable? Can we turn it into something positive? You know, the, all of those things are part of, of uh, threat uh, containment, you know? So there's the threat, there's a, a threat assessment, and then there's, there's uh, the dealing with threats. So let's, I would like to first start off with what kinds of things do you feel are real threats? And if you have things that you have identified as imagined threats, things that you think or you thought was something that threatened you, but then after you thought about it or after some experience, you realize, oh, that's really not a thing. I don't really, I don't have to deal with that. I can let it go, you know? So anyone have any ideas about what threatens them? Well, I think there are some very real threats to our democracy these days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've not ever felt that to be as threatened as I now feel it to be uh, in the current climate. And I suppose I should confess that uh, one of my ways of dealing with it, well, first of all, of course, try to be educated and educate others, but Another of my ways of dealing with it is avoidance. Uh, I was having a email exchange with a, an old friend this morning who is an activist. And uh, we agreed that sometimes it's better for us psychically <laughs> just to, 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 for a while at least not pay attention, uh, avoid the news feeds. Uh, and I know that practically speaking, not a good idea, nor is a good idea for a teacher to say, but nonetheless, it's, it's real. You know, some of the things that you read daily really uh, are really, I think, quite alarming. Um, and uh, so sometimes avoidance is my response. Okay. Thanks, Charles. Anyone else? Uh, an idea that you have for what is a threat? What is a real threat or imagined threat? Go 
Go ahead, Kathy. Good morning. Um, it just occurs to me that to answer your question, I almost need to put a frame around my role at the time. Mm -hmm. Because if I think about threats in terms of my responsibilities as a supervisor, that sort of thing, it's different than if I think about my role as a mom, a grandmother, you know, kind of thing. Um, view it differently about how much influence I can have in, in addressing that threat, kind of preventing it from ratcheting up, that sort of thing. Um, that, that just strikes me as my first thought is, what hat are you wearing? Mm -hmm. So, so it, can you talk about pick a hat, you know, <laughs> and, and talk about uh, the threats you feel under that hat? Well, I'll, I'll just give you um, an example. Um, I work on one of the uh, public university campuses. Um, actually, I'm the registrar here at Dakota State in Madison. Um, and if, if I have a um, situation where I have um, maybe a very distraught student who's very um, and comes into the office, you know, kind of thing, I have a different sense of threat because it's not just me. It's my staff, you know, um, kind of how can we minimize risk? On the other hand, um, I laughingly tell my grown sons who are farmers that when it snows, I'll try to stay home and not create, you know, problems for them in the snow. And so, you know, addressing a potential threat um, to their, you know, well-being in that way. So those are just two examples that are just this week, Lauren. So okay. Okay. Thank you. Lee, you were going to say something. Uh, I don't know any personal threats. I, I, I'm trying to think when I'm really, really threatened. Uh, I take that as a very negative. I do think that fear of something is extremely high motivator. I think it's being done through the media uh, in different angles, whether it might be advertising or whatever. But one of the threats, if I truly feel a threat, it's my concern, and I don't know that it's a threat, but it's real, and some people don't think it is, and that is the environment. I have written down my feelings about that since the 70s, maybe even before. And um, the things that were said then were considered a threat. People were laughing at it. And now I'm thinking those things have come to pass and much more quickly than I anticipated, but I'm not surprised. But then I have to look at how what can I personally do as an individual? Because I think movements start with individuals and there are many people that have done such mm -hmm. things, admire them. But I just in the, you know, people don't want to recycle. I'm, I'm worried about this. I'm worried about the future of our generations. And I have a very high hope for the new generation, you know, the 20s, 30s, teens, that they feel that threat. I see it. And if I could do something even locally, um, and of course, I have been labeled the tree hugger from the first time it came out. But I truly feel that the, the creation of our universe is in peril. And I think that is my biggest threat. Thank you. Anyone else feel 
can identify a threat. Well, let me throw out another question. We'll leave that one hanging there for a while in case you, you uh, come up with something. I think all of us have things that we can say, oh, that feels threatening. You know, even if we did maybe use that word, but now that we, we attach it to what kind of things, let's say, make us feel some change even in our bodies, because often that's how we experience threats even before we identify them cognitively, that is, we can put names on it and think about it. Often we just have a feeling that something is threatening, you know? So the amygdala or the part of the brain that sort of like goes on automatic and deals a lot with emotions, it, it and, and its accompanying parts of the brain can make us feel like uh, that thing could harm me. And you know, the, the body really just wants to stay alive. And so pretty much the brain is designed, well, stay alive and appropriate. Uh, pretty much the brain is designed around that to keep us alive. So anything that looks like it has the possibility of equating to uh, shortening our survival, that thing is experienced physically as a threat, our blood pressure changes, eyes dilate, breathing changes, muscles stiffen, uh, all kinds of things happen to make us uh, ready to either flee or fight. You know, the fight or flight thing comes. And fight and flight takes on many different uh, hats. You know, sometimes flight is as Charles was saying, avoidance, you know, it's like that's a kind of fight, a flight, you know, sometimes a uh, fight is not a physical fight, but an argument or calling up someone and uh, telling them, you know, hey, this person is, you know, like they're not on our team or something like that, you know, doing something to undermine or short circuit the thing that you think might harm you. Uh, you know, if something is going to harm your reputation, that's a direct threat because your reputation is kind of your currency, your, your social currency. And so if, if you don't have social currency and you don't, so it makes it more difficult for you to cooperate and others to cooperate with you, that's a direct threat to your physical survival. And the brain knows that even if you don't think about it, you know? So there are many things that, you know, uh, we can interpret as threats, even if they're not really, you know, or they're not ones that have the real potential to harm us. It's just, well, or let's say it, it can be easily handled, but the brain doesn't, it takes a while for it to figure it out if it ever does, you know? So uh, that said, there must be some, things, there are many things really that, uh, that threaten us. How would you tell the difference between something that's a real threat and an imagined threat? Go ahead, Coda, if you want to, if you want to uh, join in. By the way, you can just uh, take off your mic when you want to talk. You can just uh, click on your mic, mic, or you know, off in the lower left hand corner. Okay. So the question was, uh, what was the exact question? It was about differentiating between real and imagined threat, right? That is correct. Yeah. All right. That's right. Um, this also ties into your last question. I've been realizing is like if you interact with like well the people I interact with on Facebook mostly family, and this is coming up with Thanksgiving is like. I realized a lot of them, the people they follow is like regurgitate this like from Fox News, this imagined threat into their head. It's mm -hmm. like in combating that. So it's like, how do you convince them that it's like that their fear is like is unfounded? And then also it's like the fear of 
correcting them was like, how do I approach this conversation? Like that's also kind of an imagined threat in a way. I think I'm not really sure if I'm formulating this right. Well, it's it's the act of trying, Coda. That that's how we get it out. You know, it's like, yeah, that's what I mean. The imagined yeah. threat is like you feel like something is going to happen, but it's like it's necessary to broach that conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. How what have you tried so far? I know I've tried linking them to articles and stuff and just try talking with them like information, but a lot of times it doesn't work. It's like, I'm not sure they don't read it. So it's like, you can give them all the info they want, but if they don't read it, what do you do? Uh -huh. Maybe people don't uh, change their minds by what they think, but by what they feel. Maybe. You know, you know uh, I'll just say like in dealing with the threat, if we try to handle it logically, especially if they didn't come to that conclusion or that position logically, they're not likely to leave logically. No. They're gonna they're gonna leave on the same road they came in, you know. So a so lot I'll of try people, a different method, maybe. I would say, you know, if we're if if we're gonna talk about dealing with it, but but how would you how do you in your life, how do you decide that? this is a real threat and this thing is eh, not really i don't have to i think that's the question i mean you mm -hmm. don't always know it's like you kind of have to go with like what you feel is like stuff you've like researched like why do i feel this way why do i and how did i come to that conclusion mm -hmm. so if, if i'm understanding you right coda you don't really have a methodology that i you think you have to use like different methodologies based on what works it's like sometimes a one size doesn't always you know like work for every situation mm -hmm. okay but i mean for you how do oh. you how do you determine this is this is a thing that might hurt me and this is a thing that's that's uh, and let's say that person has a position that exists in their head and i'm not their psychiatrist and unless they're going to pay me i'm not going to work on that problem you know i mean how do you make a difference between those two things you know i don't know i guess i haven't really thought about that that's a good question mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you and that's why we yeah. want to brainstorm because uh other people might have a way that they that they discern that okay this is a real threat and i need to deal with that you know mm -hmm. this is it's not a thing or it's it's so it's such a small thing that it's not really worth my effort to fix it and this is a, th a small thing now but it could get bigger you know yeah 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 it's it's that's the kind of thing i think um makes us feel sometimes like a we start putting out like little fires and we never get them all out because they weren't going to be a thing they were going to burn out by themselves you know what i mean but we put so much energy into doing that that the big fire catches on so how do we how do we determine oh you know Here's an efficient way I can handle that. And then it's not going to be a, a problem for me anymore, you know? Um, it's kind of like Lee was saying, oh, I got some water on, I got some something on the stove, you know? So she can get up and go and turn that water off or she can let it boil out <laughs> and then it becomes a real threat. <laughs> After after the pan after the pan it gets on fire. <laughs> yeah. I but suppose before... I was just thinking about it because I have family coming to visit, so it's like maybe it'd be necessary to have some of these conversations. Uh huh. It's like, yeah, these are some good questions. Yeah, yeah. good, good. Anyone else have a, a, you know a way that maybe that they deal. They, they can determine what is a real threat and, uh, and an imagined threat. Anybody else? Jace? Well, what I, I, you mentioned feeling and that's, that's kind of what I go with. Uh, mm -hmm. If my heart starts beating fast and I, and I get excited or something, um, I have to determine whether that's a, uh, something that's going to physically be threatening to me or if it's something that's emotionally threatening or something that's uh, mentally or, you know, look at all those different facets. But I have to also think about, you know, if I'm going to 
fight or flight if I'm going to flee <laughs> or but I you know I really work how I operate is I think about you, you mentioned energy do I want to you know extend that much energy to try to deal with this situation or do I call upon someone else to to help me deal with it so I have you know and I have a, a variety of friends and and colleagues who who have better expertise on different things and and uh, you know I usually try to if it's something I think is serious enough I try to tap into those those contacts to to help me deal with whatever the situation is because you know we all don't have answers to things but but we oftentimes will have someone in our lives that knows how to deal with that particular situation and so i i work you know i decide which battles i'm going to take on and you know is it worth it is it worth the time is it worth my effort uh am i what are the chances of me being able to make uh effective change uh because i you know i've i, I really believe that do no harm and so when I make those decisions, I don't want to cause anybody more distress or cause harm in the whole situation, but to cause something, somebody mentioned doing something positive, you know, you want to have an outcome be positive. So, and, and that's, that's kind of how I approach the, the situation because there are varying situations, you know, what is a threat to someone may be, ah, uh, nothing to somebody else no biggie you know um well while i'm on the the line right here I, I just wanted to say thanks charles for the nice card i appreciate you um acknowledging my uh, award that i got a couple weeks ago thank you for thinking of me and i think that's another way to deal with with threats as well kill them with kindness <laughs> you know somebody really scares you or something you know no I don't mean kill him really Lee's looking at me like oh my god <laughs> so I don't mean to literally do that but you know uh, I should I should mention in case the rest of you some of the rest of you aren't aware of this Jace received educator of the year award uh, which is well, congratulations, Jay. Much deserved and long past due, actually. So, yeah, yeah. congratulations. But, Jason, Thank if you, you don't mind, could you expand a little bit on how you, how you, okay, like you have the, the feeling, as you said, but then you are going to act or not act based on whether it's a real or imagined threat. And even if it's imagined, maybe, you know, you're dealing with it in your own head. But, how do you how you how do you go about determining which is which do you have a way that you that you approach that oh uh, that's kind of a hard one to do because um i have some relatives that are, are really fearful and, and are very um nervous about different things and and I try to encourage them, you know, just just to be more assertive and to try to, you know, look at opportunities in various ways. And 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 I understand that they they are frightened to try to do some of these things. And so, I, you know, so it depends on the individual that I'm dealing with how, and how I decide whether, it, like I said, whether it's worth worth or whether it's whether it's even a, a I, I can be a positive change for that person, but it's more like a gut feeling for me. So I, we talked about intuition, you know, that one in one session, and I really, um, I really rely on how my feelings and how my heart feels about different things. So I don't know how you teach people that. All I can say is, you know, don't don't be afraid. Uh, some of these younger people, especially. Um, They'll look at me and 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 they're, they're with the big eyes and say, and I'll tell them, don't be scared, don't be scared. <laughs> you know, I take a chance, and and it's kind of um, and so it's it's, but I'm but I'm an older person, so I've gone through a lot of stuff and and um, dealt with a lot of things in my life. So, and I and I think that over time, 
And I, and I say that to some younger people. Over time, you'll have a better idea of how to deal with things because of experience and, and how, you've, how you've dealt with one situation versus another. I said, so, don't, so give yourself some time to, to learn and to experience and don't be so hard on yourself. So I don't know. I just, and I know that's not a good answer, but that's that's just how I look at. I take each individual individually and and deal with them. If there if it, it happens to be a threat associated with the person, um, but with bigger things like the loss of the Lakota language, I think that's a big threat. Mm-hmm. And and so there are a lot of folks that are trying to deal with that. And so I try to support that effort and and um, sit in and help and give suggestions, uh, find articles on uh, language loss or and then find find individuals who have the same passion to meet together and so so that we can come up with solutions as, as to how to to deal with the loss of our language. What ways can we can we deal with that? So, you take, I guess, different threats and, and do different actions to deal with whatever the situation is. It's very inflex, it's very, and I like to be flexible about that. You, do, you know, there's no, like uh, Coda was saying, there's no one answer. You know, you have, to, you have to figure out who you're dealing with and what you're dealing with and, and try, to, try to go from there. I didn't say anything, sorry. Yeah, no, no, that, no, no. But, but, actually, but, actually, but actually, I I drew quite a bit out of that. One, you said that experience, and I think that's a, that's a real valid thing. As you, one way is you just get involved with the thing, and then over time you realize, oh, I thought that thing was a thing, but now that I look at it, that wasn't a thing. Or, well, I thought that was nothing, but now that I look at it, actually, that was pretty real. I should have should have done something, and now going forward, I know I. I should do something when I, it gives me some insight into that, mm-hmm. that thing, you know. Um, there, there's also action, you know, I took from what you were saying, like in the Lakota language, if you feel threatened by some, someone, you do like Lee did and get up and go turn the stove off, you know, or go, <laughs> go, go do something, you know. Uh, and so in the case of the Lakota language, you support those those people who are doing something about it. And so even though it's a threat, your relationship to the threat changes because now you have something that's actionable. And even if it's not solving the whole problem, you recognize that from your experience that you probably won't solve by yourself the whole thing, but you can do something and you're doing that. And now you can, it's a, still a threat, but it's it's being managed. Anyone else has, uh, you know, how they, an idea about how they um, discern or, or distinguish which is a real or imagined threat? Real or imagined? I really thought, is it Joycey? Is that the way you pronounce it? Jace. Jace had some very good points. Mm. And yes, I agree with you uh, that living a long life gives you many experiences and speaking to young people a lot, especially within the family and grandchildren. Um, they're always calling me and for advice. And they said, you're such a hard nose. And I said, yeah. And they said, yeah, mom or dad or whatever it was, they would say, that's the way you lived it. And that's when you come to a Y in a road, take it. (laughs) Exactly. Because if it is a challenge and you don't let it is, fear stops you from making that movement. And if you don't make a movement, then you're not really learning and living to the fullest. You are denying yourself 
growth and happiness. And if you fail, so be it. That's life. Sometimes your failures you learn more from than successes. You don't always have to be right, but you have to be trying. So what she said, you know, just inch by inch and you learn by doing. When you raise children, if you're always holding their hands, they don't remember how to use them. And I truly believe that. And within reason, however, but too much so we avoid it in our society where we should reach out and look what's best with these, what did you call them? Threats? Threats. Decisions, obstacles, things that make you feel fearful. Yes. You know, do you lock your doors? Do you, are you um, uneasy when you go places if you don't know people? Or are you uneasy if you go and down to a area that people say, you should stay out of that area? What, how do you deal with it? Thank you. Very good conversation. Oh, thank you. Well, as we are moving into our uh, uh, last half, or actually last 15 minutes or so, I want to, to uh, explore more about dealing with threats. We have real and imagined threats. And then if we, we think about how we, first, how we distinguish the real and imagined ones, but then if we determine it's real, what are some ways, you know, and, and there are many threats, so of course there are many different solutions, but I'm just looking for just, we're just brainstorming here, throw out some things, maybe, you know, pick a situation and say, okay, this is threatening to me, this is how I dealt with it, this is how I would deal with something that I felt was this kind of threat. Anyone has any ideas of how you position yourself to deal with threats? Go ahead, Coda. Um, I don't know if this will make much sense, but I'll try and explain it. Mm. This is more of a society-wide thing, but I'll use this as a jumping point. I don't know if you've heard of this, but with the trans debate going on in the media of whether certain people are a threat, it's like how we deal with that. And then being part of that group, being seen as a threat and other people like you being seen as a threat. Mm -hmm. It's like how you deal with the imagined versus real threat. It's like, I think the answer to being seen to that is like, to not having rights. A lot of people find community with us, other siblings is like, so it's not, you're not so alone when you're fighting that battle. Mm -hmm. Finding community is a big part of it. Mm. Like you find other people with similar situations and advice to go to. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. Does that make sense at all? It makes complete sense. It makes complete sense. Yeah. It's like it's harder to it's like fall by the wayside. It's like, you know, I like just, it's easier to fight back when you have, you know, a group with you and it's like people who are supporting you and supporting each other. So mm -hmm. that was the point I wanted to make. Okay, thank you for that. Anyone else? How you how do you deal with threats? Good morning. Good. Oh, Crystal. Hi. How are you doing? Good. 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 Um, so I was, I was thinking, um, you know, sometimes threats like against your character mm. are um, are real to me, or mm. maybe they're imagined. So those are, I, I agree with Jason. She said, um, listen to your gut feeling because anytime anything happens to us, that gut feeling tells us it like fight or flight or whatever it might be. Um, we might, somebody might say something to us um, or might say something about us behind our back. 
Mm. And you hear about it on a roundabout way. Mm. That for me, like working in community is a big thing because I, I hear these things all the time. And so I have to re-examine myself and what was said or, you know, what was implied. And I take it like, is that real or is that a threat or are they? So then I have to um, calm that uneasiness down in myself. And mm. sometimes it take, could take a day or two you know, that I might just uh, think about it and worry about it. And so it's, it's something that we really have to do, like a lot of self-talk. I do a lot of self-talk mm -hmm. and just, I, I, um, I really um, examine myself. Like I have asked myself, you know, did I do that? Do I do that? Do I act like that? Uh, am I, you know, the way they perceive me? And then I'm like, you know, I have to really say it does come with um, age because in my younger years, I would just like lash back. And as I've gotten older, I realized that, yeah, you do pick your battles and you don't, uh, if somebody says something bad about you, a threat or something that you don't agree with, you can just like, as you get older or even young people can practice this, you know, not, and to pick your battles wisely, you know, and not to, um, to listen to your gut feelings and to just kind of, um, you know, just, I think, do that self-talk, examine myself, you know, did I or didn't I? Um, I think that's really important. And then staying calm about it helps me, um, you know, and just calming myself down and say, you know, that you, Crystal, cannot change anybody. You can't change anybody. They have a right to say and feel the way they want to. Even though, you know, whatever they say and think and feel about me, it has nothing to do with me. So that, um, those kind of threats, like as you're talking, that, that's kind of what I was thinking about um, when I was listening. Those, those are, um, for me, you know, those, those threats are real. Um, sometimes they can make a person feel really bad. If you're, you know, if somebody's talking about you behind your back, same, you know, things. So those are kind of scary threats. And of course, different from the threats are, you know, if they come at you and try to fight or, you know, so, um, but I'm just thinking about the threats that how my body deals with a threat, a perceived, whether it's real or perceived, I always listen to my gut feeling because that, that will not lead you in the wrong direction. If that gut tells you something that's not right about a situation, I'll, I will leave or I will just like, you know, I'm, I can't be here, you know, so I, I really do listen to that and I'll, I'll act accordingly, you know, and just bow out or say, you know, this is not the place. And it's also for me about protecting like my spiritual shield, the kind of that I have around me. I don't like to, um, you know, I try not to let um, myself put myself in a lot, a lot of those places where I might feel um, threatened. And so I think I learned that from, from age, um, you know, just from experience. I agree with Jace. And that's why she got what educator of the year. She really, <laughs> she really put it out there, you know, that um, it was made me, you know, she just basically said what, what I, I would think about. So congratulations, Jace, on, on your award. That's awesome. So yeah, that's my two cents on it is just follow your, your gut instinct. If it tells you something is not right, then, um, then just leave, you know. <laughs> yeah, when you can. <laughs> when you can. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and like, what were some situations where you can't? Like, what would it be? You that can't, you can't leave? Yeah. Like, like you're in prison. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, even in prison, you can leave like to another room. Uh, you, not always. <laughs> maybe um, you can leave like in your mind, like through prayer. You can go on a little journey. I mean, there's always something that mm -hmm. you can do to, you know, protect yourself. Even if you're around like people who are beating you, you know, you could take your mind to another to another space. Yeah. And, you know, if you, you know that uh, you're going to get beat, you don't have a chance if there's 20 people kicking you and hitting you and you know, then what do you do in that? You know, I don't know. Yeah. Sometimes there is an escape route, but you can't see it. Yeah. There are often escape routes. And so maybe the upshot of what you're saying, uh, Crystal, is 
to become more experienced in finding escape routes because sometimes it's just one word, you know, or a distraction, you know, sometimes yeah. a distraction, sometimes changing the conversation, uh, sometimes a smile and sometimes a cry, you know, there's, there are different ways to es escape, but if we don't see the magic door and we don't have the magic word to say to open the magic door, that door doesn't exist. Yeah, that's right. So, and then also, but just communicating and um, coming right out and say, you know, I really didn't feel, uh, you know, when there's a time you, when you might find a time. And so I'm like doing some, uh, I'm on a book club uh, for codependency. Hmm. And when we first started it, it was like, I I'm overwhelmed by the um, people who want to come in and read and learn about codependency. Hmm. So, you know, and that kind of helps too, because it opens your eyes to so many, so many things just on that learning um, about yourself. Mm. And nobody wants to walk around with that feeling of threat, you know, in their pit of their stomach, because then you don't want to eat, you worry too much. Mm. Uh, you know, if you feel fearful, and then sometimes that fear is contagious, you know, like, um, I had an example, where just one person was like getting real rational. And then pretty soon you go, oh, everybody you get your energy gets to everybody else and then pretty soon you have a room full of scared people over something that you don't even know is true or not it's all what if you mm -hmm. know so we just it's just interesting conversation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you yeah that's one of the reasons i try to to bring these things kind of to the surface is because actually they're always laying there on the floor we're always stepping on them or over them, mm -hmm. but we don't have a space by which we can say oh what is that thing anyway that I keep stepping over? What's the thing that I keep tripping on? What is that thing? Uh, how does how does it work for me or against me? You know, mm -hmm. um, if if there's anyone else, thank you, Crystal. That was that You're was welcome. useful. Um, is, do it? Does anyone else have any ways that they deal with threats? Go ahead, Coda. Um, I do have something to add. She was talking about an escape and with how you deal with threats. Mm. It's like sometimes the only place you can escape is your mind. It's like if an entire society is against you, if it's even illegal for you to go places, it's like you can't go outside. It's like a lot mm. of people still have that. It's like, well, how, how do you help these people? It's like, or, like, like there's sometimes there's no way to escape the bullying online or like in person so sometimes the only way you can do it is maybe art or an outlet is like there's nowhere you can really go to so it's like you have to kind of find your own escape if that makes sense mm -hmm. yep 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 and so that's kind of how i deal with it like sometimes you just have to let the threat wash over you because like sometimes fighting back could make things worse and sometimes it's just better like you people said earlier to just choose your battles and fight another day you know like save your energy for something more you know, like the more substantial, if that makes sense. Yes. Sorry if I'm taking up too much time. No, that's 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 what we're here for. We we appreciate everybody's contribution. Thank you. Well, I think some very interesting points have been uh, explored here, um, and one of the things that comes up is escape. The you know the the. Uh, the situation, and there are many different ways to escape that. And I think we also have to confront sometimes when that that actually can be counterproductive. In other words, there is confrontation. We may not be ready for that confrontation, but there is like, okay, nobody does, you know, is entitled to punch you. You know what I mean? No one's entitled to make you feel bad. And I don't really think that it should go everything doesn't need to be challenged but everything doesn't need to be just sort of let go either you know and just say oh it's not a thing and uh, never mind because if not for you maybe for somebody else you know uh, so one of the things I find that's that's useful is to imagine okay well what what is it that I can do because a lot of times 
we don't think about, okay, here's plan A, plan B, plan C. How do I think about when should I escape and how would I escape? Am I gonna escape in my mind? And what does that mean when I say I'm going to escape in my mind? You imagine that you're in another place, but that doesn't take you to another place and your reputation or your body is still being destroyed. And for me anyway, that's not a, a, a desirable outcome, you know? So like, you know, and maybe the, the solution is long-term as opposed to short-term. Maybe right now, I can't do anything, but maybe I can think of like, well, how do I avoid this situation or make it more difficult for this person or that thing to attack me in the future? You know, it's kind of like if you have rats in your house or mice, depending on where you live, you know, maybe when you first see like uh, your uh, food being attacked, there's nothing you can do about that. You don't maybe not even see the rat, but you know that there's rats because you can see the evidence. They leave lots of evidence that they've been there. And so maybe you're going to set traps for the rat, you know? Uh, maybe you're going to store your food differently. Uh, some people even just say, well, there's too many rats in this town. I'm moving, you know? <laughs> so there are lots of, of, of solutions, but what is going to be your solution? for every kind of, you know, and you, you can't imagine everything that will threaten you. There's always gonna be surprises. But as you think about them, you start to learn different ways that you can uh, address different problems. And the last thing I wanna leave you with here, because we're going to actually close a little bit early today. The last thing I wanna leave you here with you is that there is internal things that you can do that will settle your mind. And especially for the people who find their intuition and their, their gut feeling is the way they operate. One of the things that happens you'll find is that your whole autonomic nervous system gets involved with that. And there's a feedback loop so that when you get really tense, it's actually harder to think logically. You can react. But the idea of like cost benefit, you know, uh, cause and effect, those things actually become more difficult because that part of your brain actually shuts down the part that that process that makes you process so or helps you process. So I would suggest focusing on breathing, and not just when you're in a crisis situation. Focus on breathing all of the time so that your brain kind of changes. And what you'll notice is that you're little by little, at least this is the experience of many people, little by little, you're able to see and discern threats long before they show up and you cut them off at the pass. You don't let them build up steam because you do something. An example, quick example, is when you notice that there's a person who, as you feel like they gave you that funny look, you know, or that person is always cutting you off in a meeting, is you, before some confrontation develop, do things that at least make them, make it harder for them to attack you, you know, be nice to people, do things that make it, that at least make them have a second thought as to how they, or if they should attack you. But it all starts, I think, with, breathing. And uh, maybe we should do a session on breathing sometimes. But that said, uh, the, the uh, Humanities Council has a, another meeting that's right on, that's butting up right against this one. So we're going to uh, end this session uh, so that they will have plenty of time to, oh, plenty of time, like five minutes <laughs> to, to get ready for their next session. So uh, we'll see you guys next week. Please come back, bring a friend, and uh, we'll have more fun. <laughs>